I want to welcome you to the Church of Christ and those who are viewing. I want to welcome you also. We have the honor of having our, our uh, sermon given by Dr. Robert Perez on Revelations chapter 4, 1 through 11. A small reading from that will be each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under his, its wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation 4 8. Dr. Perez. Well, good morning. It seems like we're full today. It's, it's nice to be in here. A little bit cool, but you know, you could get up and move around, right? <laughs> move your hands around. So, um, um, finally, uh, following the introduction of the first three chapters, which is chapters one through three, um, Revelation chapter four and five begins what one commentator called Revelation proper. And it is here that we finally get to see John, the Apostle John's primary vision that begins to unfold. So what I'd like to do is let's begin this with a prayer. For those of you that are listening in, I know we have prayer requests, but uh, I'd like to begin with a prayer. So bow with me in prayer so that God can give us words of wisdom. Amen. Dear Lord, I pray for your ready recollection of not just my vision, but John's vision that you gave to John two millennia ago, ago so that we can get a glimpse of heaven on earth right now, right here in 2021. So I pray that you bless us. Help, help me to recall the words, not to be nervous, because it's your words. Um, bless not only me, but bless us as I give a blessing to the church and to everyone that's here and uh, those of you that are listening in too. In, in God's name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just one more time, following the introductory chapters, which is one through three, we spent five sermons on one through three. Um, Revelation four and five begins Revelation proper. And it is here that the primary vision of the book begins to unfold. Okay, so I gave you a quick glance, a quick glance for those of you that have missed the last five sermons on chapters one through three. So chapter one through three basically is the revelation of, to the seven churches that John sees the glorified Son of Man in chapter one, verses 12 through 18. And through that glorified Son of Man, he tells John, which is Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, he tells him to write to the seven churches. And in the seven churches, you notice that there was a fourfold pattern, a real easy pattern to follow. The first pattern was to the angel of the church. Each of the seven churches begins with that little phrase, to the angel of the church, and he names the church in each of the seven churches. The second was, these are the words. So it's Jesus, if you notice in your Bible, it's red letter edition. Jesus is speaking directly to John through a vision, and he's telling him, right. The next one is, I know your deeds. And I couldn't help but think of Santa Claus on this. It's the naughty and nice list, right? If you really think, I know your deeds, and there's some churches he has to censor, to correct. Remember I said five of the seven churches he asked to do what? Do you remember? He asked them to repent. And two of the seven churches he commends. It's commendation. He commends their faithfulness. And he tells them, stay faithful to the end. Be strong. And so that's the naughty and nice list. And it's Jesus saying, I know your deeds. And as we read these, and I give you summaries of that, always reflect on ourselves in the reading. Does God know our deeds? Right? He knows everything about us. And we have to read this text as a mirror, and as, as I'm reading to you and reading about what happened back then, it's God telling us he knows our deeds, and he knows what needs to be censored, and he knows what needs to be commended, amen? The last thing, he ends each of the letters with this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And I thought it was interesting. He doesn't say what I say to you or what I told you to write. Let them hear what the Spirit says. So it's just interesting that he says that. And that's a quick review of the message to the seven churches. So now we enter into Revelation proper. And here is the vision. 
And just one thing, yesterday when I prepared this sermon, I decided instead of preparing the sermon in my office, because of this text that I'm going to read to you, I decided to prepare it in here. It was cold. I was by myself for a few hours. And I just felt God telling me, just prepare the sermon in here. Because in the scene that we will see that John gets a vision and he enters a door and he enters the throne room and it's the throne of God in heaven. And I thought, I need to be in the sanctuary. It might be a traditional thing, but I just felt I want to prepare my sermon in here. Just to maybe get a little experience or a feeling of what John might have felt like as he was revealed to him this vision and he was able to go through the portal of heaven, this door, and he was able to peek into heaven and see, in a sense, what, was, what that vision was like. Um, usually I give a thesis statement before I begin and read. I want to give my little thesis statement an idea just in case we get confused with the reading. So here it is. Revelation 4 overflows with specific details, colorful descriptions that can easily distract one from the main idea. So one more time, Revelation 4 overflows with specific details and colorful descriptions that can easily distract one from the main idea, which is that everything points toward and revolves around the throne, the throne of God. And it's a beautiful scene. It's a beautiful vision. It gives me the chills just thinking about the reading that when John was on the island of Patmos and God gave him this vision and we get to read it right now in 2021. So this is why I read, or I stated earlier, it is here that the primary vision of the book begins to unfold. And not surprisingly, John begins, not just with the throne, but what it represents, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. And I want you to hold that thought because it's a challenge to us right now If we truly believe in the sovereignty of God, then we have to truly believe that God is on his throne right now. And he knows exactly what's going on in our world right now. Not about the future. Not about these timely events down the road, but right now. Okay, that's what Revelation chapter 4 is. It's a vision to compete against the illusion that the people in power of their day was the true vision of God. You peel back that reality, the physical world, and you get a glimpse of God's throne in heaven, and you see the true reality, that God is on his throne. And that's what Revelation 4 is. And that competes against the powers at bay in the time that John wrote this. If this book and John's message is going to compete against the Roman powers, it better be a message that's powerful enough to convince Christians that are struggling to it, some of them to the point of death, that you could stand firm, that God is on his throne. And that's the message behind Revelation 4, Revelation proper. So with that in mind, let's read it. And keep in mind of the persecution and the seven churches and you being in a church that has to be censored or commended. And then he gives this vision to maybe get you out of our personal problems for a little bit and show us the glimpse of what's happening before us so that we can say, I believe again. Amen? So with that in mind, let's read. It's a powerful reading. One last thing I want you as I read this. See if you can keep up with the reading and count. How many times, you don't have to say it out loud, how many times the word throne is mentioned in verses 1 through 8? Okay? Just keep a count. 
After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. It's interesting that last, the last church, the church of Laodicea, ends with the words, I stand at the door and knock. And now God opens the door. So just keep that in mind. So I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice, and the voice I had first heard, notice that he had first heard, that was the voice in chapter 1, when he turned and looked and saw the glorified Son of Man standing there. So it's the same voice. This is Jesus. If, he, if you interpret it that way, the voice that he first heard, that's the glorified Jesus that I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet. And this is an imperative. This is a command to John. Come up here. And in 2021, and those of you listening, he's telling us to come up and look into his word and peek into a glimpse of what it's like, what the God of the universe is on his throne right now. And he says, come up here. And I love this. What is God trying to do is by you sacrificing your time right now, he says, I will show you what must take place after this. And after this is referring to the message to the seven churches. So we have to stay grounded that the seven churches, he was writing these, this message to churches that were struggling, maybe some doing a little better. And he was writing to encourage them that after this, after the, my commendation and censor, this is what's going to take place. And here, here's where Revelation proper begins, and here's where I want you to begin counting. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting, and it says, on it, but I put in my version, on the throne. Because it, it refers to the throne. Twice. Verse 3, And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, Remember I said about being careful about being caught up in the details. And a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. There it is again. Surrounding the throne. And it's interesting. He gets into these elders. There were 24 elders. Or 24 other, excuse me. There were 24 other thrones. There it is. Five times it's already mentioned. Just in the first two verses. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed, and he describes what they were dressed in. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold from the throne. Now, here's another. No, see, just it's that throne imagery. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass as clear as crystal. And I couldn't help but think, what did this symbol, what was this? Until the other day, I parked my car over there by the pier on San Juan Street or San John, however you want to say it. Walked out to the edge of the pier and prayed. And the sea was as clear as glass and you could see it for miles and miles. And it gave me a little glimpse of maybe what he was seeing, the vision. And he says, in the sea, sea of glass, clear as crystal... And then in the center around the throne, there were four living creatures. I mean, what a description of the vision that John sees. There were four living creatures, and they were covering their eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face like a man, and the fourth was flying, flying like an eagle. And each of the four, each of the four living creatures had six wings and covered their eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So those of you that were counting, did anyone have a count? Eight or nine times, right? Right? If you look in the Greek, yeah, eight times I, I counted in my version because I put it and I put the throne. But in the Greek, it's 11 times. In the first, actually 14 times in the first 11 verses. 
because they don't use pronouns, they use the word itself. So, the scene is all about the throne. Now here's how I want to interpret that. Why would God, or why would the vision to John, why would he want him to see this vision of the throne? And, and the detailed descriptions, and like I said, um, we have to be careful of getting so caught up in the specific details and colorful description that we can easily distract us from the main idea, which is that everything points toward and revolves around the throne which is really setting up God's sovereignty. So here's one interpretation of this, and it's the one I'm going with today, okay? Revelation 4 is not necessarily a vision about heaven, which is we use this text to say this is a clear description of heaven. Yes, it is, but that's not the main point. It is not a vision about what's going to happen at the end of time. This is a vision of the present reality that God, through John, is trying to convince these seven struggling churches that God is on his throne now, and it's a counterclaim to the sovereignty of Rome in chapter 13, where the beast, and he's given authority, and the dragon is given an authority to rule the people of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth, those who compromise their faith, even within the churches through the Trojan horse of assimilation and have bowed down to paying taxes to these governors or paying homage to these governors and laying their crowns and their lives before him. And as the people in Pergamum or Sardis or Thyatira and these members are walking down and they're seeing all these statues, you see a picture, and I love what Mike Cope did at the Pepperdine Lectures. He says, He's telling his little grandchildren as he's walking down the streets of Pergamum that although these statues seem powerful and a great story to tell your children, the real story is in the message of this little church that meets on 276 West Pergamum Avenue in Santa Paula. What you're hearing right now is the real message. So it's not a vision about one day God is going to rule. It's a vision about right now. And if we could strip away the physical world and pull back the curtain and see his reality, we would see Revelation chapter 4. Now i got to convince you of that. What popped in my mind as I read this text, if that's what John is trying to do, trying to peel back the illusion that the dragon and the beast is in control, that Satan and the Babylons of the world are in, have sovereignty on earth. If we peel that back, we will see that God is in control. And what popped in my mind was a story in the Old Testament to back up this point. And I have to read it because then I'm gonna give two more points on Revelation. So we just read the throne room. He's setting up sovereignty. You know, there is another scene in the Old Testament where God peels back the illusion that a king or a prophet and a servant are surrounded by the army of the Arameans. And it's the story in the Old Testament. You don't have to turn there. I'll give you a summary. It's the story in the Old Testament in chapter 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha, the prophet, and Israel is actually in, I guess, war against the king of Ar the Arameans. And what happens is the king of Aramean, of, I guess it's, I don't know how to say where it is, but the Arameans, he kept on planning his strategies to attack Samaria, but Elisha, the prophet, would find out about it. He would go and report to the king by God's presence. He would tell, he would find out about it. He would go report to the king of Israel where the, the Arameans were going to be at, and they were ready for him. Well, the king find, finds out, not the king of Israel, but the king of the Arameans finds out, and he sets a trap for Elijah and his servant to kill him because he's infuriated that he keeps on finding out or giving the details where their army is going to meet him. 
And that's the story in 2 Kings. And what happens is the king does come, sets a trap. And here's the scene. I'm just going to read it. When the servant, this is in 2 Kings 6, 15, and I'm going to come back to the throne scene in Revelation 4. When the servant, this is 2 Kings 6, 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. So he, he, he saw the vision. He, it wasn't a vision. He saw the army surrounding him. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, Peel back the illusion. Peel it back, Lord, and show us the reality of your sovereignty on earth. And look what he says. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. So Revelation 4 is not a vision about heaven necessarily. It's not a vision about what's going to happen at the end of time. This is not a vision. It's a vision of the present reality right now. And it's not a vision about one day God is going to rule. It's a vision about right now and if we could strip away the physical world and pull back the curtain to see his reality we would see revelation 4 which is just like the story i just read to you so before i go on to this here's why i wanted to state that and there's no way around this in chapter 1 when God sets up the Son of Man imagery, it was for two clear purposes. Divine protection. Remember the stars in his right hand represented divine protection. And out of his mouth came a sword, divine judgment. So in order for someone to discipline the churches, he had to be someone that had the authority enough that the seventh grade students in his classroom would bow down to the authority of the teacher. That's just my little version of it. I wanted to say that because what popped in my mind as I think about God's sovereignty and authority, he's going to write the churches and start opening up seals, seals, the seven seals, to actually... Could I say it? Carry out his divine judgment to the inhabitants of the earth. And those who are the inhabitants of the earth are usually people outside the church, but there are some people within the church who have bowed down through the Trojan horse of assimilation, and judgment comes, begins with the house of God. Amen? Amen. The four horses of the apocalypse. That's, that's as we get, begin there. So I, want, I, I guess my point is, when I was a school teacher, you cannot teach unless you establish authority. Bottom line, you will not be able to teach a one assignment if you don't have classroom control. And when there's a sub that comes, guess what? It's a field day for the students. So that's what John is doing here. Chapter 4 and 5 is really setting up divine authority because, or God's sovereignty because he has to compete against Rome. He has to compete on who's in power right now and he has to strip that back the illusion that the substitute is in control. And really, it's not the substitute that has authority, it's the teacher, it's God. It's his sovereignty, amen? He's in control. It's also interesting that he mentions elders here. Amen? A healthy church embraces authority. And a healthy church bows down to the right people in charge. So these are my two points. 
One, if you look at one through eight, what you recognize is first thing is we need to peel back the illusion and recognize true authority or God's sovereignty. And here's how we recognize it. One, it's God's voice in one through three. Um, there's elders mentioned, 24 elders mentioned there. So do we need elders? If we want to have be under God's authority, any church that's healthy has elders in the church. Amen? And if we don't have official elders, we have men and women that have been here for a while that function in that role. Amen? So we might as well bless them. God does. There's a weather theophany in chapters 5 and 6. Figure that one out. The only vision that came in my mind is every once in a while, a movie will get out a scene right. And the one movie scene that popped in my mind as I saw this weather theophany of peals of thunder and flashes of lightning and rumblings was the movie Independence Day. Sorry, I'm modern Will Smith was in it. But there's a scene where they show the clouds coming and it's rumbling. And I don't even remember there's lightning and people are just stunned at that image. And that's a weather theophany. But in here, what comes out of this weather theophany is not judgment, it's good news. It's angels and, 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 the, and these four creatures flying around with the face of a lion and the face of an ox and the flying like an eagle in the face of a man saying, holy, holy, holy. They're recognizing, it's the recognition of divine authority. We can't see those angels right now, but they're here. You, you may not believe it, but they're here. I stand at the door and knock. Revelation chapter 3, verse and I lost my place, so I can't find the exact verse. Some of you that's looking in chapter 3, find that verse and tell me which one it is so I can help the people online here. Oh, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. My professor in class on Revelation said he showed a cartoon version of this. And there was a couple, an older couple, eating dinner, watching TV. And Jesus was at the door and the screen was open. And Jesus is at the door knocking. And the two couple whisper to each other, how long is he going to continue knocking? <laughs> you know, it's, that, that might be us. That we're bugged by the fact that Jesus is knocking and we don't want him around. Thank you. 320. Thank you, Ramon. 320. So there's a weather theophany. There's lamps lit, which represents in a, to a chance and a in a sense, our church. Seven lampstands, the churches. That's not our lamp. That's not our lampstands. Let go out. Let's not let them go out, okay? I know some of us are creaking into action when we come to church. I have arthritis in my neck, and it bothers me every day. And I just realize that's my thorn in the flesh. I pray that God heals it. I do the best I can. And if you are here with an ache and pain and you're here, thank you. Continue to creak into action. And those of you that are younger, when I see Caleb up here being a young person or Evan and some of the younger, Asher and Samantha and some of our younger people in the back, you got, I think it's Stacy and daughter. Okay. That ain't, that's encouraging. It's not let our lampstands go out. There's the ocean scene, and these creatures are incredible, the four living creatures. And they're important because when you get to chapter 7, or I mean the next section, chapter 6, they're the ones that summon the four horsemen. It's not God that summons them or John that summons them. It's the four horsemen, or it's the creatures that summon the four horsemen. And you can look at that. They say, come. They summon them, come, and they come out, each of the horsemen. Four horsemen of the apocalypse, you might say. Okay, so my point A, just in case we missed it, and I know I get carried away and get caught up in this vision and the details and stuff because it's exciting, is that there is a recognition of divine authority. And the way I try to illustrate that, if you walk into a classroom, in a middle school classroom, and you don't, you don't get your authority right away, it'll be chaos. 
That was my number one fear, my number one weakness, my number one thing that I had to work on for 20 years. Set up your authority and your parameters so you can actually teach. And if you can't, you cannot teach. And I'll just one last joke. The last year I was teaching, I remember one kid I saw that was in my class at Denny's. And he goes, Mr. Perez, that was the worst class I've ever had. That was what he told me in Denny's. And I said, you know what? You are right. <laughs> it was. Because it was. I had no control of that class. It just got to the point. In one period, I just could not get a handle on it. And he was right on. And he laughed by the fact that I acknowledged that. And he bought me a dinner. <laughs> so maybe he was, maybe I'll see him around this one day again and get a second chance at God's church. Amen. So if recognize divine authority. That's my first point. Recognize it. And the second thing, this is powerful to me. Respond to it. There's no way that you're going to bow down to someone that's not more powerful than you. <laughs> I'll tell you one little East L.A. story, and then it's going to relate to my last point. Respond to divine authority. One of the funerals that I got to preach in 2017 was a, my dad's best friend growing up in East L.A. His name was Ernie Lopez Jr. And his dad, Ernie Lopez Sr., I have a book written about him and it's in my room, says from San Quentin, Folsom, and back, Memoirs, uh, memoirs of an East L.A. Outlaw. Well, I got to preach his son's funeral, Ernie Lopez Jr., because Ernie Lopez Jr. was my dad's best friend. And he told me he was a gangbanger all his life, Ernie Lopez Jr., but he didn't do the things that his dad did to be in prison in San Quentin and Folsom. But he said he liked to fight. And one time, and this relates to responding to divine authority, okay? One time he was in East L.A. driving his truck, and a guy cut him off, and he got mad, and he started chasing him in his truck. And he chased the guy all around for about two or three miles and finally the guy in the front car got frustrated and stopped his car and got out. And he says, what are you going to do? And he looked out and Ernie was driving his car and he got out and he was ready to fight him. And the man who got out was a young, strong, big, 35 to 40 year old as Ernie Lopez described him. And the guy looked at Ernie and realized he was an old man. He was 70 years old. He wasn't even strong anymore. And he looked at him and he said, what are you going to do, old man? And Ernie Lopez looked at him and he said, nothing. <laughs> nothing. And he goes, you crazy. Anyways, he goes, come on, I'll buy you a beer. Don't go get a beer, okay? But the point is, he recognized his limitation. He recognized authority. Amen? That's what the next little scene is in verses 9 through 11. All these creatures with authority are flying around, recognizing and being in God's presence. And look what happens. I'll start from verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and with covered eyes and all around, even under its wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And look what it says when they see God's presence. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, look what the elders do. You want to be an elder in a church? This is what they do. The 24 elders fall down before him before the throne, before him who sits on the throne and worship him and li who lives forever and ever. And then they do something even more incredible, not just worship him. They take out their crowns and lay it before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created. They recognize divine authority, God's sovereignty. They recognize it. And that's important, amen, in 2020, to recognize that God is on the throne right now. 
For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And that's not the end of the story, but I have to quit now. Next week, there's one specific aspect of this scene that, that's continued. And I'm just going to leave it there, but let me just give my three takeaways. Number one, the purpose of Revelation chapter 4 was to establish divine authority and God's sovereignty. John's, John establishes God's authority and the need for the members, and it's tied back to the church, the members of the seven churches to believe in him so God could take on Rome. And I put Rome's, the Rome's of the world. God could take on Egypt, the Pharaoh in Egypt. God could take on the ba Babylonia. God took on the Roman Empire. Could he not take on the Babylonias of today? Revelation 4 is not a vision about heaven so much as it is a vision about what's going to happen or not what's going to happen at the end of time. This is a vision of the present reality and it's not a vision about one day God is going to rule. It is a vision about right now. For us to bow down and recognize and to submit and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I will take off my crown and lay it before your throne because there's victory in the slaughtered lamb, which is Revelation 5. If you believe that and you're not a Christian, then I call you to pledge allegiance to God right here before us as we stand and sing a song of invitation. And... For those of you that haven't put on Christ in the ritual of baptism, I ask you to. Because that's one of the few rituals that God left besides the Lord's Supper. May God bless you as we stand and sing. Song number 552, Have Thy Own Way.